We have a great turnout tonight, 33 participants so far, I see. And thank you all for showing up and supporting us. I'm sure you've never been to a Greg Delancey reading quite like this before, but you'll soon agree that this is a great way to spend the evening, mutter, mutter, before St. Patrick's Day. But before we begin, I want to say a few thank yous to the people involved here. First, Greg Delancey and John Murray, who have broadened out their original plan to include Sarah Blair and Young Tradition Vermont's Fiddleheads as their guests, and they'll be on later. Greg, John, Greg, John and, Sarah and Sarah have been amazingly been flexible. As there's a big echo for me, can you all hear that? Is that just okay? Did that just happen? Yeah. Sorry, well, I, I just put on a speaker, so I turn okay. it off. I was saying that Greg, John and Sarah have been very flexible as we negotiated getting everyone on board. And we thank Young Tradition Vermont, uh, Fiddleheads and their parents, as well as Mark Sustick for organizing their appearance. Mark is the founder and executive director of Young Tradition Vermont, which has surely done more in the last 10 years to promote traditional music and its growth among youngsters in Vermont than 10 arts organizations could have done. And their collaboration has been huge uh, for, with the festival now for many, many years. Finally, a big thank you to our president and technology guru, Jim Shields, who's working over and above his part-time, his full-time job day and night, putting together not only this webinar, but all the live events and the playlists for this virtual festival. Without him in these COVID days, we wouldn't have a festival. And together with him, um, because of all the generosity of the performers submitting their talents, I think we have a great festival to be proud of. So here's how the festival will go, we hope, or the evening will go, we hope. John and Greg will read and play for about an hour. And then to join them for the last 15 minutes, Dick will introduce Sarah Blair, a master fiddle player and teacher from a Young Tradition Vermont, along with her group of young students who've been doing a three month residency with her. Okay, how's that? So now I'm happy and proud to introduce Greg. Where are you, Greg? Come back. I'll be back. <laughs> Greg Delancey is a celebrated poet on both sides of the Atlantic and a recipient of many awards, including the Guggenheim Award for Poetry. Born in Cork, he has lived in Vermont for more than 30 years. He's placed in the Irish tradition, but also considered a Vermont and US poet appeared in many significant US anthologies, and he's the author of numerous collections of poetry, including his latest, No More Time, which we will present here along with some, he will present here along with some translated works. I believe he was just reviewed in the Irish Times last Saturday, and he's also got a full feature coming up on Irish TV, Radio Telefisarin, if you can get that, this Sunday, National Poets Day. Um, Colin McCann, an Irish novelist, has described Greg as the poet laureate of the contemporary Irish in America, and he's poet in residence at St. Michael's College. So take it away, Greg. And John, John, where are so you? I, I, John, I'll just read uh, two poems to start with, and we'll go from there. You play then straight away, the two of you. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, you'll know when I... You'll please. give me the nod, I, right? I, I, I didn't say this. Uh, Elizabeth and everybody, because things are getting kind of complicated in every way. And we had the new book, No More Time, which is a book of my own poems and which I will read from. But I won't start with that because I have another new book coming out at the end of the month in Britain and Ireland. And um, he, up, up a bit. Yeah, it doesn't. It, I, it's not out here yet, anyway. So it doesn't really matter. But it's it, it's um. It's the translated poems of the great uh, Irish, both Irish in Irish, Gaelic and, uh, and Irish, Sean O'Reardon. Um, and uh, I want to start a couple of folk a lot of my St. Patrick's Day. Um, uh, I need me over to Lord. On 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 Dawn Shaw, uh, Australia. Uh, I translated it with my great friend Liam O'Meara, who I loved, uh, uh, who my closest friend in Ireland, the great poet in Irish and Gaelic. And he, he's not here; he died 
year before last and um, I think of him every day really um, we were brothers we grew up in the same city we went to the same primary school secondary school and um, college and he wrote in Gaelic and I wrote in Irish anyway I, that is an acknowledgement to him before I read it because he helped me with these translations so here that is to Liam about to Liam and the book is actually dedicated to your ear on pumps but or on, for those people, and I suppose most people don't know, you know, me, and if you do, then you'll have to excuse my assumption. But um, Sean Erdogan was the person that modernized in literature, well, in poetry at least, in literature, um, and was isolated for it in the 1940s and 50s. It was the time of De Valera, of the, the Colleen and the Podato and Little Farms. And, you know, we want to go, we were kind of being forced back, as John and I will know, and anybody else here from Ireland when we went to school. I mean, Norovig, uh, 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 oh, fuck. I won't go, sorry, I shouldn't do this because you don't know. And um, when, um, when we were taught in school, we were taught actually Irish and so forth. But with the same methods that were, the, were used by the British and the Irish. So, you know, the Irish took over the usual, unfortunate um, uh, heritage that was we took over from our captors and those who punished us with the tally stick. And it was bad. I mean, I loved some of the teachers and so forth. And I know, I often ask myself, well, I've hit the kids. And I don't think there was any teacher that didn't. So I, I'm not judging anybody. I've no interest in that. From that world that grew up, that no nobody now, unless you grew up in Ireland at that time, up to the 19... I went to sec, high, uh, primary school and high school, would know and understand it. And John will. John, don't you, John? We used to yeah. get... Uh, but, the but, the stick, the cane, the leather. Oh, daily. I certainly got beaten once every two weeks and for the whole from the age of six to the age of 17. I, no? I was a daily recipient. Yeah, I want to say, though, that they were great people, too. It was a different time, and you must understand it like that. And they just were trying to keep the Irish alive. But Orion was attacked for trying to modernise it with Elias and Auden and everything else. But he used to go, his, his refuge out of Cork, he was grew up in Cork. He, he worked in the car um, part. Anyway, I shouldn't I shouldn't go on. But he used to go on to to uh, 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 Dingle. In this poem, and in Irish, it's um, it is um, anyway West Kerry. I say the the blast gets run by the Skelligs. He's down in Dun Queen. That was his refuge, and he made his life there as much as could out of the Cork City, which was and is still in many ways a combination, the nearest combination, according to the BBC, which of course they're always right, um, to uh, the closest thing in the English language to Elizabethan English, including outside of England, I mean, including England, and the closest thing in the English language to Gaelic. And um, so I wanted this significant because we are tonight returning to the world we, where you are all your ancestors, ancestors and so forth and he goes back yes. return again I, I, I won't it says fog clown the gout for clown the gout he means the world uh, the, the mad world but actually there's a space in Kerry as he would have passed called Blown Nigalt, which is where they used to send the mad people, supposedly. But anyway, and I, that will come up in the last poem. I'm going to read the last poem as a translation of the great Irish poet Sean O'Reilly from the great Irish tradition in Irish. This is just a translation. Leave the mad world behind. All that's coursing through us this year of our Lord. Put it out of our mind, the pale, the battle of Kinsale, 
And since the load's heavy and the road long, untackle the halter of the English Pegasus, Shelley Keats and Shakespeare. Return again to what's us. Ease your mind. Relax your mouth haltered in the syntax that thwarted your voice. Make a clean breast of it. Make peace with your own race, with your own place. It's not natural for anyone to ditch their own country. On a bright afternoon, take the cliff road to West Kerry. On the horizon, you'll catch the sight of the collective blaskets, the subjective skelligs, the ancient school of Irish shoaling from the mouths of people. That's your entry. <clears throat> Doom Queen in the evening light, knock on your own true self will open sesame. All right, John, you ye fly away. All right, so uh, I'm John, and that's my good friend Annabelle Moynihan who's joining me tonight. And we're going to play a few tunes and uh, thanks to Greg for having us. <laughs> I'm going to do a Patrick Kavanagh poem. I know a lot of them by heart, so I'll just say this. The great Patrick Kavanagh from Monaghan, County Monaghan. Probably. Yeah? Greg, are we supposed to, you, you're, you're going to, you're going to poem, you're, you're turn now, right? We just play it by ear, John, yeah. I was going to go now. Yeah, just let us know when you want to come back on. When you want us to come back on. Sorry. I, I don't know what's happening now, really. Thank you. 
Um, so, um, I'm going to say a Patrick Kavanagh poem, um, who was the great poet from Monaghan, and then I'm going to say one of my own, and then we go back to um, John. John, I'm sorry, I don't remember. Annabelle. Annabelle, excuse me. Um, sorry, folks, we're, we're kind of winging it just a bit, but you're not beautiful. Um, Patrick Kavanagh, for those people who don't know, um, was the great, no, okay, Yeats was the great poet. In many ways, Kavanagh was closer to being Irish than Yeats. Yeats created the world and had a great variety in his poems, uh, both skill, skill and, um, and, um, uh, and subject matter. Um, and I will, fin I will do a Yeats poem at some point, maybe. Um, but Kavanagh, was close to the Catholic sense of in Ireland in a way that no other poet was before that. And when I say Catholic sense, to, to the farmer, to the re regional world. And he was probably the poet, but well, he is the poet that it probably influenced most of all the poets, including Seamus Heaney and John Montague. And they were all here, by the way. Seamus and John Montague and Neil Merrill, who I dedicated, they all were here being uh, and, and visited a number of times. Seamus came twice, Liam was three or four times. So I just want to know that they were on the streets in Burlington, you know, um, which is kind of lovely really, for you to know. There was many, many British poets have been to St. Michael's. Um, so the, the Patrick Kavanagh poem is set very, it's called Now Leave the Czech Rings, sorry. It's called um, To the Man After the Harrow. And in order, just one other small thing to say, no, a little bit of autobiography. I mean, I know it sounds like a million years ago uh, that the fields, you know, he talks about a man following the fields with a plough, with a horse and plough. But I remember when I used to lifeguard in Inch Beach in County Kerry and the Deagle Peninsula, they were still plowing the fields in certain farms, but with horse and plough, 1970s. Would you believe that? And bringing the turf and the milk on the donkey and the cart. No, no, I'm not making this up. You know? So anyway, this poem is called, it's a beautiful poem, really, by Kavanagh, by Patrick Kavanagh, called To the Man After the Harrow. Now leave the check rain slack. The seed is flying far today. The seeds like summer against the black eternity of April clay. The seeds as potent as the seed of knowledge in the Hebrew book. So, drive your horses in the creed of God the Father as it stuck. Forget the men on Brady's hill. Forget what Brady's boy may say. For destiny will not fulfill unless you let the harrow play. Forget the worm's opinion too of hooves and pointed harrow pins or you are driving your horses through the mist where Genesis begins. Extraordinarily Buddhist poem uh, in, in its own way, you know, to know at the end of it, you know, if you are driving your horses through the mist where Genesis begins, every moment is Genesis, Jesus. I mean, beautiful. Um, I'm going to be. De I'm going to take a chance now. Oh, well, I'm, I'm going to read um, a poem, probably influenced by Kavanagh. Um, poems to his mother and father when they died, and Seamus Heaney was influenced by them as well, uh, and his great 
parent post. Um, I don't mind, but I'm going to read, it's my early, one of my earliest poems I wrote. I remember writing it in Bell and Bunyan. I was like, and uh, uh, it's a story to it in a way, but I don't want to go on too long, but um, uh, my dad had died um, that six months and I got a, a group of villages and they, they became, I think, probably the best poems in uh, my first book. And actually this poem finished the Field Day Anthology of Irish Writing, which was a very prestigious, extraordinary anthology uh, of three volumes and two more of women. I won't go into that, but um, this was the last poem in it. it start, the third volume started with James Joyce and I was the last. The, the, third, the start of the whole, I mean, this is encyclopedic novels. I mean, um, books. I was so proud, really. Um, but all, but, but um, it's a sonnet, and um, it today also is my father's anniversary when he died um, in 1985. So there's a reason for me doing it, multi reasons, really. You know, we're getting to the point now where we all the lot more people that we know are dead than we know they're living. And I, I love the living, but I also miss the dead. Who are not dead in me anyway, but I miss them. But this is a poem called Leave Taking. And, you know, all of you, it's a kind of an American way you could even make it, you know, where, 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 where when people left, they left for good or bad, really. Good for good as in time, but other people behind as your parents and grandparents and great grandparents and so forth. I don't think uh, it's it's um, an understatement to say that their worlds were different and I think they had a much harder time. And I'm only leaving Cork railway station here, but my dad worked from eight in the morning to set five at night in his printer. And I mean, his life was much harder than my life. And my mom, my mother, Never said more. Crikey. Anyway, leave taking. If you're at a train station and you're brought early by your dad, I was always late. I'm always late still. Anyway. Leave taking, sonnet. After you board the news, me. After you board the train, you sit and wait to begin your first real journey alone. You read to avoid the window's awkwardness, knowing he's anxious to catch your eye loitering out in the never-ending rain to wave a bit shy another final goodbye. You are afraid of having to wave too soon. And for a moment you think it's the train next to you has begun, but it is your train. And your face is pressed to the window pane, distorted and known by the icy glass, pinning your eyes as the train, oh, I, uh, I became immediately, uh, excuse me, I, I, I was aware I was on a tightrope with no book in front of me and I fell. But there's a net underneath and we'll try it again, all right? Excuse me. Actually, I'm a great believer anyway of hearing poems a few times because it's very hard for you to pick them up in the airwaves unless you know them already in writing. Anyway, let's see, can I do it this time? No, I'm completely subconscious. I'm really risking it now. After you board the train, you sit and wait to begin your first real journey alone. You read to avoid the window's awkwardness, knowing he's anxious to catch your eye, loitering out in never-ending rain to wave a bit shy, another final goodbye. You were afraid of having to wave too soon. And for a moment you think it's the train next to you has begun, but it is yours, and your face pressed to the window pane is distorted and numb by the icy glass. Pinned upon your father as he cranes to defy your disappearing train. Both of you waving eternally to each other. There you go, John.
They're muted. What? He's muted. Yes, and I can't unmute him. I asked him to unmute, but I think they're too far from the computer. Hey, Joe. <laughs> Mayday. <laughs> I just learned another lesson on Zoom. I thought I could mute and unmute. I can only mute and then the person has to unmute themselves. I won't do that again for the music. I apologize. Okay. It's okay. It's fine, Chip. It's fine. We're fine. Okay, John. Um, I'm going to read a bowling poem. Um, I don't know how many of you know what bowling is, um, but it's with um, eight ounce uh, metal ball. You're only played in Ireland. Oh, sorry, only played in Cork and Armagh. And um, hey, John, you're coming through there, man. That's, that's a picture where the, the thing was, um, it's in the cover of a collected, my collected poems way back. But it turned up in the Leaving Cert in Ireland as the one of the, I actually, like, I mean, it was on the course, but I never thought my brother rang me up and he said it came up in the Leaving Cert because his niece was doing her Leaving Cert and it came up in the past. And I got a great kick out of it. I don't know, do any of you know what? Elizabeth knows what the Leaving Cert is, but um, it's a big thing. Forget the Nobel Prize. You know what I mean? And you have to be dead anyway to get it. I mean, it was very unusual. Um, and I got a great kick out of it. And I still get a great kick out of it. And um, it's fabulous. Really. And it, it, it was originally in the Atlantic Monthly, and they gave it the whole page with the picture itself. The photograph. So it's, and I was showing around an American poet, John Ingalls. I, I went, who died, who was my, whose office now I, I'm in in St. Michael's. Um, so a lot of connections um, and, and more, really. You know, I love, I, I mean, there are, Cork people can be a little bit over the top with regard to coming from Cork, you know. Um, and I would say that to Cork people. If, if they're here, I mean, I, I'm not embarrassed. I, I think it gets a bit too much, but I am also, I love it. I was never like for, uh, other previous writers that said you had to leave it. I, my, my leaving was, um, was just the way things, my life went. It was neither one nor the other. I didn't, you know. And, but this poem came when I was showing around in the, in the Mark Museum, in the Crawford Art Gallery in Cork, uh, John Engels another American poet who worked at St. Michael's and who was my senior. 
and some of you will know him, uh, and, uh, and, and and this is good to to remember to be memorial to him. But anyway, he turned up in the leaving cert on the page, and they were all the poor kids. Of course, I was delighted, and I actually that night when I was reading in James Joyce's tower in um, Sandy Mount, uh, give a reading with uh, two other Irish poets, John F. Dean and. Um, or, or two women. Uh, anyway, I won't go into it, uh, but it was an honor, and uh, this is an honor, and um, it has a different texture about it just because it turned up in the leaving cert. By the way, also, I was not supposed to be good at school. Slow, I was slow. I was in the worst. There was four, four, um, four um, streams of classes in the in the public school, and I was in the bottom one because I couldn't spell and I still can't spell. So, um, so there's some teachers must be twirling in their graves when they saw a poem coming up and the leaving cert exam, which is the exam at the end that all the students in Ireland have to do to, to, to decide their lives, where they were going to go, whether it's university or elsewhere. And when we were doing it, it was Keats and uh, Shelley and Yeats and so forth. Kind of brilliant, really, for me. <laughs> I remember I was given out a year later, and my brother, who's Norman, he said, I was given out, like I said, I, I, there's things I have to do. Yeah, he said, but you were in the leaving search. I was pissed off at the time. I didn't feel I was, I was at a lockdown in my own writing. He said, but you got into leaving search. I said, well, I won't say what I said, but I killed him. Um, I'm not finished yet. But it's called After Viewing the Bowling Match at Castle Mary Cloyne, 1847, written by, or sorry, painted, this was painted by, that's the painting in the front, um, by uh, in 1847, with no hint of the famine. I promise to show you the bowlers out the Blarney Road after Sunday Mass. You were so taken with that painting of the snazzy, top-hatted peasant class, all agog at the bowler in full swing, down to his open shirt in trousers, as indecently tight as a baseballer's. You would relish each fling span along blackberry boreens, and delight in a dinger of a curve throw as the bowl hurls out of sight uh, not to mention the earthy lingo and antics of gambling fans giving players thumbs up on down the banks. It's not just to witness such shenanigans for themselves, but to be relieved from whatever lurks in our background, just as the pitcher's crowd is freed of famine and exile darkening the land waiting to see where the bowl spins off a planet out of orbit and who wins. Um, and then one poem, I include my mother in this, um, when she was dying in uh, Mary Mount, uh, it's set in, um, it's set in, um, in, in a hospice for those who are dying of terminal diseases or terrible sicknesses, or whatever you might call them. Um, I'm just going to read this, and I'm going to just go into one very short one, John. I'm going to bring, all right? Yeah, and no problem. I'm just trying to connect things, really, you know what I mean? Um, but um, there's a number of things in this that are also peculiarly Cork, and there's a thing called the Noble Call in Cork, a sing song. And I actually still joined this, there's a singers club on Sunday that I get on Zoom in, even from here. Sing songs were a big thing in, in Cork, I think especially. I grew up in a house where everything was celebrated around drink and usually in a bar and then maybe afterwards in the house and people would sing. In our house, we didn't have music. In fact, in our house, in, in, we were quite middle class, lower middle class, upper working class, which would have nothing to do with, at that time in the 1960s, Irish music was not looked up to. Uh, Irishness even. Because it was a way out of 
poverty of the old world. No, no, why not? Sure, I mean, the great or rare and the or rare dawn and, and other people revitalized it and gave dignity and, and made it popular again in a way that was never popular at the time to the world. Or rare that opened all that up. But these are people from Blarney Street, from my, my, my people, who came in from the country in Bear who were starving. And their only way out of it, they felt, and I believe that they're right, was to, they couldn't, you wouldn't get anything in Cork City if you were speaking Irish. You wouldn't have got much in America when you got off the ship if you were speaking Irish. You know, I, I won't go into this, like, but this is not a funny thing for me. Sorry, John, and I. Um, there's nobody loves Irish music and knows more. Well, anyway, I won't go into it, but um, to my mother, um, Eileen, and the noble call was, if you sang a song, you had the right to call the person who to sing next, whether they liked it or not. Um, and they had to sing. So I'll be noble calling now, John and Annabelle in a moment, but not yet. All right. Tonight I keep watch up. This is, I went home off the plane, get off the plane, get, get into the hospital and see your mother dying. Tonight I keep watch over your dying. The most peaceful night I ever knew. I suppose it's the release of your going, drawn out over chemo months into years. I sued your agitated hand. You lie under the nightlight's nimbus, reflected within the black window. Your bed and you fly in the pain above the city Saturday night din. Pure Chagall. You head into the stars over Summerhill, Tapwell, Evergreen, the Black Ash. Hover above familiar streets and lanes, bars, folk singing. There is no need to dash. Your name has just been noble called. Sing Soul of the Border. One last time, you raise your voice above the lee, the tongue you hold a lifetime of plastic bags through, bowing into the drizzle, drudging home along North Main Street, up Blarney Lane, or City of Hills, or Frisco, or Rome, or Buenos Aires, or Varanasi. Rain weeps on the pane. Your hand must be waving adios. Ma, the night sky reflects our city below. No, every light's a votive candle, your Fatima. Behold the glass darkly. There you go. And um, I, I should probably should have said that when she was dying, I could see I, her reflection was in the dark of the window over the city. Maybe you probably caught that from the poem, but it was rather strange. And you could see the city right below. So there you are. And now I'm going to read an environmental poem. I'm going to move from my mother to Gaia, or mother. And, um, and then I'm going to finish up with a few of them, but not, no, I'll just read this now, a very short uh, little poem from the Greek anthology, book 17. But it, it's written by me, but it's about by somebody else. Um, Gaia, I'll just read it and then I'll, you, you, you play, okay, loves? Gaia, the earth mother. But as I say, like, anyway. Are we all right, John? Oh, yeah, we're proud. We might have to adjust our camera. Can I? I'm going to um, put our camera on, keep the sound on so we can hear you, but I want to put the camera on, turn the camera off. I think we might have the fisheye lens on just for a second. Sorry? It doesn't matter. Nothing. No, we can good. see. I can see you. and. Good. Everything's no. good. All good. Okay. Beautiful. Keep going, Greg. Um, it's beautiful. All right, man. 
Um, it's just the only, um, I should have marked this now, and I'm sorry, green line. Too many paid poems, maybe. Was it on the whole time? Okay. Um, uh, just give me a moment, please, now. Um, but, uh, why don't you just play a quick one, John? What I'm trying to find is, why don't you play a, pick, a quick one and I, I, what I'm finding this, you know? I call on John to sing a song. Ah, uh, John, go on, sing a song. All right. That's what I think we should do. Very good. A Patrick Kavner song. Oh, I just, do I need to unmute? On Raglan Road, on a... Oh, no, on Raglan Road. I know. Go on, John. I've heard our care would be the stair that I would one day rule. I saw the danger. I saw the danger as I yeah, walked walk. along the enchanted way. And I said, let grief be a fallen leaf at the dawning of the day. On Grafton Street in November, we tripped lightly along the ridge of a deep ravine, the deep ravine where can be seen the work of the work passions, passions pledge. The Queen of Hearts still making tarts, and I not mm -hmm. making hay, for I love too much. And by such, by such, is happiness thrown away. Oh, I gave her gifts of the mind. I gave her the secret sign that's known to the artists who have known the true song of birds and stone and words and tint I did not stint. But I gave, I her, gave poems her poems to say, with her own name, and her own daughter, like clouds over, over fields, fields of May. On a quiet street, the all goes meet, I see her walking now, away from and me. away from me so hurriedly. My reason, All reason was allowed that I had loved none as I should. As I should. A creature, oh, creature made, made of clay. clay. When the when angels, the angels they lose his wings at the dawn of day. Sorry, excuse me. John, beautiful man. I, I was singing myself along there. I don't know who, who heard or didn't hear. But that's the same Patrick Kavanagh that, of the poet I read earlier on. Um, so just interesting for people. Um, but I'm going to read my, a ma poem now, a mother poem. Uh, I just left my ma, my own, per, my own private ma, into our ma, our mother, our earth. And... I am green in many ways, and I have devoted my life in the last 10 or 15, 20 years to being green. I just want you to know that I give up my car. I'm not, I'm putting my poems where my mouth is. I give up my car. I cycle everywhere right through the winter. Solar on the roof. Uh, uh, no gas or oil in the house. Just, we can't, we must get out of the ivory tower. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm not, you must do that too. Anyway, I mean, it's harder in certain jobs, you have a job and stuff. Um, but this poem was written when I was looking over at um, a camel's hump. Jesus, what's the other one? Um, um, oh dear. Uh, what's the big oh, one? No, Mansfield. And I, get, I was on the bus, actually. Um, and I saw Mount Mansfield from the hospital because sometimes when the snowing, You'd have to, I'd, I'd have to put, I'd cycle in town, put the bike on the bus and then, and there was no snow in Mount Mansfield. 
in the top and it was winter still and that's not good and so this poem came out of that and it's yeah yeah somebody suffering from cancer and so forth there is a tie-in from my own mother and our planet the snow has melted clean off the mountain it's winter still Yet, another indication that Gaia is in trouble, that things aren't sound. The rocky mountaintop shines like the bald head of a woman after chemo, who wills herself out of her hospital bed to take in the trees, the squirrels, the commotion around town, sip bare in a dive, Smile at the child ogling her shining head, wishing it didn't take all this dying to love life. All right, John Boy, are we done? Are we? Are, is it half seven? There's still time. I think they're going to come on around seven forty-five. Okay, well, good because I want to just do a few poems from the new book, and then when I'm done. I mean, I'm sorry. Thanks, John, for away, and Annabelle loves. And you're muted, John and Annabelle. John. Okay. Here. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> Thank you. 
Beautiful, John. Um, I'm going to read um, another Gaia poem, really. Um, I, I shouldn't be so explicit, and I should leave you do the work to understand, but I understand that most people aren't interested in poems. But would you ever go out and buy this book called One More Time? <laughs> Actually, all the money goes to um, to 350.org, um, who uh, I'd been involved with from the very start, way back before it was called something else, um, Step It Up and so forth. But um, this book, No More Time, um, actually is a development later on of another book called uh, So Little Time, but that's another story I want. Um, but this is, I'll read one and then another, and then I let John take over again. It seems that we have another 15 minutes or so. Um, I, I remember I worked as a life captain. Mary Heaney, Seamus, his wife, wrote, anyway, I won't say. I'm, um, and it was in the Irish Times before last, um, the kind of, which is great, really, again. Uh, you see, it's lovely for, for for the poems to be read in a public forum rather than in these literary magazines and so forth, no matter how good they are. For me, what good is it? Um, and the uh, literary world is very competitive and, you know, it's hard to be. It's just a beautiful thing to have them in places like the Irish Times or the Atlantic or other places, other great places. And uh, and the leaving cert, although I'm sorry for the students, to be honest, but there you are. Um, one more time, sonnet. Call the earth female, as of old. She needs to be placed pronto. I should say, this kind of comes to my lifeguard days, when I've had occasionally to have put people either to resuscitate or uh, kiss of life is what we call it. Um, and also then put them in the, in the um, recovery position. Um, if you could get them back to life. Anyway, one more time. Call the air female, as of old. She needs to be placed in the recovery position. Gently hold her chin up. Bend the left arm at the elbow, hand above the head, palm facing down, waving goodbye or hello. Set the right arm straight and in line with her head side. Quickly tuck the left foot up against the right knee. Watch for a sign of breathing. Don't forget to clear out the mouth airway. She may need a kiss of life. She'll recover for sure, only without us, maybe. Who then will tell her we miss her? Who then will tell her how oh dear she is? And then just one other poem. Um, from the book. Um, Sorry, um, are we all right for time? I, I'm just, I see some of the kids. Hey, Dominic and Dominique. Yes, and, you're fine, Greg. Sit another 10 minutes or so. Until okay. Sarah comes, just go ahead. Yeah, lovely to see the kids. Lovely to see Dom. I see Dominic Cloud, but and other students, lovely. Thank you, other young people. Lovely. I'm looking forward, we're looking forward to hearing you. Lovely, darling. And Mark, what, where am I? Anyway, lovely. Aren't you lovely? Um, and by the way, this book is also dedicated, the book, you should read the, sorry, I read it, the dedicated, it might give you some sense of the book. And um, this book is for everyone, of course, but it's especially dedicated to all those who work to slow climate change. Uh, the book is also especially dedicated to my son, Dan Delante, my nieces, Nia Delante and Sarah Delante, and Greta Thornburg, who you know, in class and local, they used to be always at the demonstrations. And my son was martyred from being on my back at demonstrations and vigils. 
and all future generations. We want you to know not just for ourselves, that some of the people got before you are trying not to let you down. So there you are. I'm going to read them. Um, all the poems are written in Terzarima sonnets. There's a whole set of Terzarima sonnets. Now, it's important for me that you understand it. Because they're written in rhyme, but they're written in the rhyming scheme of Dante's uh, Divine Comedy, which is the great Christian poem of the Middle Ages. And I think that Christianity has been good in certain ways, but it has divorced us from, in the Western world, from the natural world. Human beings are central, and everything else is to our use. I mean, even Christ's life, really not compared to say Hindu world and so forth animals or plants are really very secondary and it was where the devil was put when Christ went to the banish into a pig or a sheep I mean the poor pig and sheep we are now discovering that they actually have actually they're intelligent they can feel and think and they have feelings but we we have disconnected ourselves from that word and I for me the book is about in its form, even in the form of the, the framework of the poem is connecting back to Dante and I'm putting animals and plants into the underworld of his underworld to correct the long-staying attitude of the Christian world in the Western world. Uh, that's me. For me, that's important for you to know. Um, it's also important for me to know that I'm also connecting back and jump because the 20th century and modernization has gone too quick. So I'm connecting back to um, the, 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 the world before industrialization, which was also much more connected to the natural world. And humankind became got mad in its new inventions and etc. So there is a double thing going on in the paradox. And I, I'm going to read a, a poem called The Earthworm. Um, and there is an epigraph in the back of the book, which I didn't put actually on the poem. Um, but by the way, the poem is made up, the book is made up of hell, heaven and earth of plants and animals and creatures, including ourselves. I'm an animal, you are too. Um, and um, the earthworm, um, before, it, it, again, this was put in the Atlantic Monthly, but the earthworm, there's an epigraph to it. From earthworms, we learn that before anything grows, there has to be prepared soil. Uh, when we talk about the endless process of bringing briefs and information to government, the only thing that can keep us going is the notion that it prepares the soil. It may not change minds, but it will provide the argument for a time when minds are changed. Unless there is that prepared soil, no new thoughts and no new ways of dealing with problems will ever arise. So from the earthworm, we learned that, the, 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 the humble earthworm. Anyway, this is the poem. And it's a, it's a Terzorima sonnet. Well, a Terzorima and then a double line at the end, um, which is kind of love poem to the earth as well. I'm just going to read this, and then I think we have to pass it over then to the, 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 to Sarah and the beautiful children, or young people, excuse me. Um, I'm sure I'm still young too. I know I just dyed my hair grey like John. All right, earthquake. Sorry, earthquake. earthworm. This is kind of funny too, because there has to be some humour. Humour is the refuge of a desperate man. I mean, it's a way out of being alive in the world is the way perhaps to survive i think and it's the great humble thing um this is kind of for me it's like christ um earthworm uh, no the earthworms they face 
in opposite directions to reproduce. Just remember that, right? And there's a kind of funny end. Um, poem. In Tazarima, finishing with a couplet, a love poem. What a, a minor, pistoning in slow motion through the underworld of the earth. Engineering vents, channels, water flow. Converting death and dearth. Day in, night out, each eyeless body digesting the soil, nursing birth. Cut in two, they double, breed via marley skin, a must for farm and garden, alfalfa, spuds, spinach, carrots, cabbage, barley, wasibi, wheat, gourds, rutabaga, papaya, endive, you name it. Build them a shrine. May these lowly laborers of Gaia multiply, flourish, never decline. Stick with warm love, position 69. All right, I don't know what's happening next. Is Sarah there? I think I thought I saw her, I, but maybe. I am, can you hear Good. me? Good. I yes. don't know why my name says Mark Sustic. <laughs> no. I could never fill those shoes. <laughs> so I'll leave it with you now. We leave it with you. Well, here you are, and here Mark yeah. is, and I will turn you over, Mark. Yes, Greg. Greg, thank you very much. That was a beautiful. I, I got to see the whole thing. It was wonderful, wonderful words. John and Annabelle, thanks for thanks for the music. So uh, welcome to this segment. This is uh, going to be Sarah Blair and Fiddleheads. I'll say a few things here and then turn it over to Sarah. Uh, my name is Mark Sustic, uh, Director of Young Tradition Vermont. I want to thank the Irish Festival for making this opportunity available to Sarah and these young musicians. Um, you're going to be seeing and hearing the result of a three-part residency that Sarah led that started in early February. And uh, those were all on Zoom. It included um, 14 young musicians. Uh, if everyone's here or everyone shows that said that they're coming, eight of them will be here tonight. Um, just a few words about Young Tradition Vermont, if you don't mind. Um, we're a nonprofit organization that uses trad music and dance to inspire young people to give them opportunities to learn and to give them chances to perform. That's a big part of what we're doing, what we're doing here. It's very motivating and rewarding to learn something, then be able to share it with others. And then we like to have them use their inspiration and their abilities to perform to serve their communities, including organizations like the Irish Festival. Um, we operate 30 programs, depending on the time of year and, and sometimes what year it is. Uh, Fiddleheads is one of those 30 programs. You can find out more information on the Fiddleheads has a Facebook page and also youngtraditionvermont.org on the on the website. Thanks again, Elizabeth and Jim and Patrick and Greg and John, Annabelle, everyone else who's involved in making this this happen. Uh, we all love having the chance to be part of this festival and have been um, Young Tradition Vermont has had the privilege of being part of it for many years. Last year we were. Well, a little over a year ago, we were all seeing Altan play at the at the Flynn, and uh, it's hard to believe it was it was a year ago that that happened. Seems like yesterday. So you're going to see Sarah and see and hear Sarah. You're going to see the young musicians playing the tunes that they've learned from Sarah. Um, and I'm going to take the risk here and mention who you're going to see playing. And uh, they may may not all be here. There may be some that I'm that I'm not mentioning. But it's and it's all on me if I excluded anyone. My apologies if that happened. So we've got Abigail, Anna, Abe, Ben, Mared, Elise, Jonathan, and Thomas. Welcome to you all. Now uh, I was I say this during these Zoom calls. Uh, no, thank you, Elizabeth. No one's going to be able to hear you clap or holler or cheer, but I, I hope that you'll do it anyway. It'll make you feel better, and uh, we'll we'll hear it over the over the airway. So, here you go, Sarah and Fiddleheads. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much. It's you know I I never want to miss the opportunity to 
to highlight just how invaluable Mark is to us all for um, encouraging traditional music for everybody and especially traditional music for kids in in every you know mode and style you can think of um, he's really a, a dynamo and we're super lucky to have him so thank you Mark for inviting me to be part of what you ironically called a residency sort of a non-residency but um it was great to work with the kids. It made me yearn all the more to get to work with them in person because um, Zoom is a, is a pale substitute for um, actually making sound waves together. Um, but still, great to see you all and thank you all, all you kids that are here for joining us. We've got three tunes that we learned over the course of three weeks and we're going to play each of them three times. Um, we're going to start off with a polka. Polkas come from County Kerry and the Schlieve Lucre area. Um, and this one is called Terry Tian's Polka. He's a well known musician in that area. Um, so, what we'll do is, uh, unfortunately, you'll only be able to hear me. I really wish you could hear the kids, but you'll just have to imagine it all the better. And then, you'll, then you can imagine what it's like with the kids playing. Is everybody ready? You want to have your fiddles up? Everyone remember how this one goes? I'm going to play a couple of notes just to get you started. Right? Are you with me? Here we go. Uh, one, two, ready, and... playing in tune. That's how in tune you were. I could see it. You should all be laughing. Okay, so let's do the jig. What do you say? This is a jig called Hoey's Jig or Hose, Hose Jig. Um, it's also called Max Fancy and a bunch of other names too. Um, but we like this one because it's got lots of accidentals. That's, that's some of us, some of our pro musician speak right guys accidentals so we'll play this one too for three times and that's the one that goes this way hey we all y'all with me oh i'm a loud tune all right so uh one two ready
job. Good job, everybody. What concentration? I'm seeing a lot of, I can, I can hear you thinking. Look at all those brains working so hard. So uh, one more tune, and this tune has one of the best names of any tune ever. This one should be, it, 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 it implies a poem for sure, Greg. This tune is called, If We Hadn't Any Women in the World, or If There Weren't Any Women in the World. And there's a tune that goes with it called, If There Weren't Any Men in the World, just so it's equal time. But this one we learned is, If There Weren't Any Women in the World. And this one has accidentals too. All right, are we all ready? So this is our last tune. We just had the three. Thank you so much. Thank you kids for coming out to play. It's wonderful to see you. And happy St. Patrick's Day to everyone. I hope you have a wonderful week and you hear lots of beautiful music and poetry and eat some good food and have a good cup of tea perhaps or another beverage. And uh, so have a great week, everybody. So here's if we hadn't any women in the world. Just to remind you all how it goes. Okay, ready? Uh, one, two. wonderful thank you sarah and the fiddleheads and sarah i have a question were the fiddleheads beginners when you began three months three months oh, ago no no, no. They, these are these are seasoned players some of them have a lot more experience than others they're all ages and 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 uh, amounts of experience but no i didn't start any of them from scratch it was only it was three one hour sessions but they did, a, they did a great job really great job sarah Yes. Can I talk? Am I on? You're on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're um, on. But it would be so great to hear them. Yeah. I, to see, I mean, it's heartbreaking to, I mean, lovely to hear your beautiful playing, but love to hear them I'm more. with you 100%, Craig. And as it, just wouldn't, it just won't work on Zoom, Greg. Of the yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. But it actually makes it more poignant in a way, really. Yes. Yeah. 
It is. You feel the lack a lot, you know. Anyway, but we love you, darlings. Thank you. Next year, next year for sure, we'll have the fiddleheads in the city hall at the Cayley, won't we? We'll look forward to it. We'll start planning now. But thank you. That was hey, wonderful. Will you let me read a poem at it when you play, please? Yes, yes. You're invited as okay. of now. You're on the list. You're on the billing. I, I want right. I... So Greg, you're gonna you're gonna close up with a couple of poems, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. And to, to thank you know. so much, Sarah and the fiddleheads. <laughs> Thank you, loves. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. But thank you. The names are all wrong, so I'm afraid to say any names. Um, on the thing. But anyway, kids, lovely to see you. It must be strange for you. Anyway, we love you, Dora. You do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, uh, this is Mark. I'll just say uh, you've got Abigail. Maybe you can wave when I say your name. Abigail. Oh, good. Thank yeah, you. okay. And uh, Anna. And Abe. There's Abe. Ben. Yeah, be there he is. Mariet. 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 That's an Irish name. And uh, Jonathan. Jonathan. Yeah, okay, great. I think that's everyone. That's an Irish name, too. And Sarah. <laughs> Woohoo! Yeah. Okay, so what, what, what time have we got now? Have we got two minutes, three minutes, or four minutes, or one minute? Whatever okay. you feel like. Yeah. And we can, uh, two points, uh, so. Greg, are you up for questions and answers at the end? If sure. There yeah. are oh, yeah. any? There are any. Yeah, we, we, I've uh, asked people yeah. to put them in there. Maybe leave the kids go. I'm sure like it's strange for them, but I don't I don't need. Anyway, thank you, kids. I don't know. Can they hear me even? Yes, uh, everyone can stay if you want to. It won't be. It won't be much longer. And uh, mm -hmm. no, no, I'll only be. Yeah. I'll only be three minutes. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, but I'm going to finish with two poems. Um, one from one from the book that is yet to be born, though it is on its way. Um, it will come out later this month to Britain and Ireland, as I say, and and the translation of the great poet who wrote in Gaelic, 20th century modernized. Um, Gaelic into a modernist word. And I'm going to read from this book at the end then. But I'm going to, um, apathy is out. And there's a connection Leave the lab, in the first poem I read over your dawn, which is the first poem I, re I read, there was a connection, leave the mad world behind. And I mentioned in that, that there is a valley in, in, in um, Kerry, in, uh, in um, the Inga Peninsula called, and still called, the Valley of the Mad, um, Lone Galt. Galt is mad. And where used to sin, literally mad people. Well, that they said were mad. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, people said were mad. So that's a reference to that. And I called it Mad Valley here. I, I took a liberty actually in the last minute, kind of referring in a way too to our own Mad Valley, you know, the Mad River, Mad River. We have a mad river, the mad river out in, out in just beyond um, White River Junction. I try to connect all sorts of things because the book is about connecting and about how we're connected under the, under the skin of difference, almost of everything. And I'm not saying just us as human beings, but animals and plants and so forth. Anyway, but Oriol was onto this before, in an amazing way, before anybody was, I think, in a way that. Eliot, none of them saw this. The early poetry of modernist poetry was about um, um, this connection, Eliot, the breakdown of society, human centered again, and fragmentation, the love song of J.R. for Prufrock, the great poem, in the wasteland. And these had a tremendous influence. But this is O'Rear Dawn and a poet writing in Ireland in Cork. It's his only, I think it's the real genius, the breakthrough poem. I don't think he realized what he did, and I don't think anybody realizes what he did except I do. Um, for basically, Apathy is Out, it's called. And, and, uh, and this book is called Apathy is Out, the selected poems. There's not a fly, moth, bee woman or man, 
whose welfare is not our responsibility. To ignore their predicament isn't on. There's not a person in Mad Valley we shouldn't sit with and keep company since they're sick in the head on our behalf. There's not a place, stream or bush, however remote, or a flagstone north, south, east or west that we shouldn't consider with affection and sympathy. No matter how far South Africa, no matter how distant the moon, they're part of us by right. There's not a single spot anywhere we're not part of. We issue from everywhere. Now, that's in Gaelic. I mean, that's just a translation. You know? The poem was completely lost at the time. But I'm going to finish up with, um, I've talked about the Terzarima and the 26 sonnets based, taking back with Dante and putting plants and animals into the Christian hell, purgatory and heaven, which of course is our word. Um, but this is a slightly longer poem. And I, I mean, it's just a page, you know, but I know your attention spans are beaten on. I shouldn't do this to you, but I want to finish on an up note, not because to make things positive, but to make things true. And it's called counting. And it's me looking at the back out in, with, with the board feeders. Now you just hold your concentration for two minutes, maybe three. And that's it, then I'm done. And thank you, everybody. And I won't say too much afterwards. And thanks, John and Annabelle. And thank you, Mark. And thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you, all people I haven't said yes. And thank you, children. And those who people are listening. And I can't see you, you see. Counting, to count. How do we count for human beings? You try to snap out of it. Me. You try to snap out of it. All right, I start the poem, shut up. You try to snap out of it, not think. Think otherwise. Say you matter in whatever small way possible, along with the nearly 8 billion other humans. I'm going to break the poem now. Humans is spelled Y-O-U-M-A-N-S. I won't, I, start, I won't do this now again, right? Sorry. But I will start it again. I want to say something. I have never read this. I've read this poem only in a few places, and it is, it is in the middle part of the book, which breaks the Terzarima sonnets, the connecting back with the past and uh, environment, but it's still connected to our attitude, and how we're going to survive and how we're going to manage within ourselves. And I'm sorry to explain the poem, but it's impossible for you to lift this off the airwaves without me saying something about it. Uh, I'm not talking to a group of literary people who, you know, uh, well, maybe I am, but I don't. Uh, but the literary world is a different world and it's stupid sometimes. Counting. You try to snap out of it, not think, think otherwise. Say you matter in whatever small way possible, along with the nearly 8 billion other humans inhabiting our terrestrial ball. A figure, it would take 250 years, give or take, to come to, if each number is given a second. But by then, your second would be long up, blink a second. Blink you're born, blink you're gone. No, blink you are born and gone. What can you do, an unbeliever, unable to fall back on the grand eternal, unblink, and his assurance, you matter more to him than a flock of birds which to most believing blinks means you're not worth much. 
you yourself would consider that a high compliment, being such a bird lover, especially of the goldfinch nesting in your garden, weathering Vermont winters. The males each spring turn bright yellow, the color of happiness. Seeing them at the sunflower feeder gives you a lift. They appear fixed entirely on their own lives, concentrated, vital, hovering. They remind you of the hummingbirds sopping from your ruby feeder, the feeder resembling the votive mantle on the candelabra in St. Mary's. You'd slip the penny through the slot, light a candle in the fluttering red glass, pray a child's prayer for all the poor and suffering of the world. Today, watching hummingbirds, the penny dropped again, pleasurably clinking, bringing you to your senses, thinking how fast the hummingbird beats its wings at the votive. 50 times a second and not just up and down, but each time rotating their wings in a figure eight, which means there's no start or end to each beat storing sweetness in their ruby throats. Tell them they don't count. Tell them they're nothing. No, tell yourself. Yes. I should have mentioned um, something I can't remember uh, oh, 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 something about um, oh, Christ saying oh, God, you are more important to us than his flock of spar sparrows. Mm. Some of you will know that. But most you were thinking of that, or I was, anyway. Good, thank you, that, thank you. That was a very powerful one to finish on, Greg. Yeah. Something uh, to think about. Yeah, yeah. So will we leave a go now, or...? Well, thank you so much. It, it was just wonderful. And with all, even with all the glitches and the commotion and the laughs at the beginning, it was all part of it. It was great. And then John and Annabelle and Sarah and the Fiddleheads just really made it glorious. So yeah, thank I think you. Forget, forget the question good. answers, on this. And there's it's, one you can question write to me. It's like, uh, let's see. Can you speak about, this is from Cindy Hill. Can you speak about why the Terza Rima fits your intentions better than the Petrarchan sonnet form? Well, it is a sonnet, but it's a new kind of sonnet. I mean, it has been used a few times, but not in... There was only one other person that did a sequence that's well known. Dare I say it, Shelley. And it was huh. not very successful because it's a hard thing to do in English because there's less rhyming words in English. There are great, there are great versions of that, 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 that particular type of... And there's the great, um, I've been one acquainted with the night by Robert Frost, which is a completely great poem. But he, it was just a once off. But, but this is a long sequence. So, you, you know, I was brazen. I was brazen. You know what I mean? <laughs> and um, That's good. And I, 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 the way things are right now, you know, Dante was just a human being like you and me are. We, we elevate people into places that uh, are not true to them or to us. Um, and I, I'm sure there are people. I mean, there are. I've heard. Actually, so how did, who does he think he is? Like writing and comparing himself to Dante. I'm not comparing myself to Dante. I'm <laughs> writing Dante is even worse again, and um, because I'm putting the connection was actually Cindy. It's even more interesting. Dante was interest. Dante. It's probably almost certainly true that he was influenced by some of the Irish texts from the Irish monks of a descent into the underworld, including Sante Brendani Navigati, which was a connection of Brendan going trying to find the underworld. And that this is where it's actually there, there are allusions in the Dante that could be said to be from um, the Gaelic. 
uh, of the Gaelic monks dis descending, the Irish crowds descending into the into the underworld. The Irish priests, monks, saints, Brendan and well, St. Patrick and Loch Derg. But anyway, that's right. So my reasoning for the Terzarima, since it is the most powerful and greatest poem and one of the greatest pieces of writing ever written, was just a normal, ordinary person, which of course Dante was. I don't really understand how anybody can be anything else. Um, but it was all human-centered. It was all human beings. And that underworld and the underworld is really about our world. It's not about, there's no underworld. For me, I'm an unbeliever. I don't believe in any of that stuff, you know? Um, although I still technically... It's, but hell is beat into the back of me. I'm still sort of afraid of it, but in my mind, I don't believe in it. But in my fears, because of from <laughs> being beaten and so forth. But, um, in, but so the reason for, for me putting into terms of Rima, the first lines was to connect back and correct the Christian world, which the Western world is basically a Christian world. And it comes out of that. And, and we've disconnected ourselves from the natural world and the environment. And therefore, here we are. Well, Cindy responded that it was bold of you to do it and kudos to you. Well, it was bold. I, I, my English teacher, I rang him, I said, a bit brazen, but I don't think of it like that. I just think of myself as a normal human being as, as he was. And the world, we are so small right now, why should we think of ourselves as big? Even that idea is stupid to think of Dante as big. Nobody's big. <laughs> we might be big among humans, but crikey. We're nobody. We're not. We're. Do you remember? Do you have, look, I, I, I'm, I'm into astrophysics and also into the, the whole science of the world of space. And now we know quantum physics. I mean, we're just. An ant would be would be months would be huge and glorious if we were ants, <laughs> you know. And then we think of the Dante ant. Well, thank you very much, but he's the greatest poet that he read and wrote something extraordinary for us ants, as or sparrows, sparrows, and sure. sparrows. Well, I know I'm I'm not I I love Christ, but I'm not gone on the Christ that didn't didn't acknowledge the a, a natural world. <laughs> I mean, in fact, let's go out and catch a few fish and prove a, prove a miracle. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, no, no thought of. I, I, I'm sorry, but the, the Buddhist crowd have, have much more of a handle on our connection to the world than we've had as human beings. And we've enforced this on the planet. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry to say this. I'm not sorry to say it's just a fact. So my connecting was connecting back in my way as one ant. An ant would be grand. As though Ezra Pound said, the great Ezra Pound, of course, who was an awful character in certain ways, what thou lovest well remains, the rest is dross. What thou lovest well remains, um, uh, the rest is uh, Bow down. Uh, the ants is center in its dragon world. And that's what we've been, haven't we, uh, centers? Um, so that's, I don't really care what people say, what I think. I'm a human being like that. And make them talent, but don't care. It's too late now to care for those people. Amen. Okay. Well, Greg, thank you, and thank everybody. And the uh, John is he still here? And Annabelle, Sarah, the Fiddleheads. Um, I think it was a wonderful evening. It'll keep our spirits up for the rest of the winter. I think. So thank you all, and um, I hope we'll see Sarah tomorrow for sure in our grand finale. And uh, many more, and my raid will be there. Many more of you, I hope. Many more of the attendees. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much again. It was a great evening. <laughs>